I welcome everyone on behalf of Pediatric Nephrology to this uh, morning's uh, multidisciplinary meet. And we will be discussing a case that has been on a long-term follow-up with us and she's awaiting a kidney transplant. Initially, we thought that it was a simple case of uh, structural kidney disease. The kidneys were small when she came, but along the way, uh, Dr. Thakurwil will be telling the story that she has, uh, 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 she has uh, the, 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 the disease that has evolved. And uh, we'll have with us Dr. Nathan from uh, Renal Transplant, who will be discussing a bit about how access in uh, maintenance hemodialysis kits is a problem. Dr. Anubha from uh, Skin uh, will also uh, help us to come to a diagnosis of what actually this child had, and Dr. Sanjeev from Allergy Immunology. In fact, Allergy Immunology was involved with this case from the time that she had presented because she had certain features. So I just wanted to invite uh, uh, Dr. Thakurvir, please come and start. So good morning, everyone. Today we will be discussing this case and uh, discussing about chronic kidney disease, its etiology, complications, management, and renal replacement therapy. So we had Miss V, who was born in 2009 in Sirmaur, Himachal Pradesh, to a non-consanguously married couple via term normal vaginal delivery. She was developmentally normal and apparently well till 10 years of age. She was first admitted with us in August 2019 with complaints of fever for few days which had subsided, followed by vomiting for 15 days, then easy fatigability and decreased urine output for last three days. There was no history of any loose stool, cuff or rapid breathing, abdominal distension, rash or joint pain, jaundice, any altered sensorium or abnormal body movements. The examination revealed stage 2 hypertension with a height that score of minus 2.34. She had paler and the rest of the systemic examination was within normal limits. The urine examination revealed 2 plus albuminuria. So a working diagnosis of acute on chronic kidney disease versus acute kidney injury was kept. The further workup re revealed pancytopenia with deranged renal function tests, hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, and metabolic acidosis with decreased ionized calcium. The ultrasound revealed bilaterally kidney size of 6.3 and 6.1 centimeter. As for, for her age, a child would have uh, approximate kidney size of 9 centimeter. So her, both the kidneys were small and shrunken, with raised cortical ecogenicity, with uh, irregular urinary bladder with wall thickening. She had pleural effusion as well as pericardial effusion. So a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease was considered. So now coming to why did we consider the diagnosis of chronic kidney disease? The definition of CKD basically tells that it has to have a damage to either the structure or function of the kidney which can be manifested as a glomerular filtration rate of less than 60, calculated by this modified Schwartz formula, like EGFR is 0.413 into height in centimeter divided by serum creatinine. So this gives us an estimated GFR. So if this is less than 60, or we have markers of kidney damage in the form of albuminuria, abnormal sediment, as is seen in tubular disorders, or abnormal electrolytes, or we can have evidence of kidney damage structure on histology or imaging. But these have to be present for a period of three months to label it as a chronic kidney disease. Our index patient had bilaterally small shrunken kidneys with a GFR way below of 60 value. She had just 4 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square. So now coming to the staging and prognosis, the CKD is staged for glomerular categories as well as based on albuminuria. The glomerular G1, G categories range from G1 to G5 with progressively decreasing renal function and decreasing GFR and albuminuria from A1 to A3 with progressively increasing albuminuria, that is the protein is being lost in the urine. So based on this we can see the prognostic classification. This is important because say if a patient has a GFR of around 50 which falls in the G3A, G3A range with a proteinuria of A1. So then he will fall in the range of this yellow category, that is a moderately increased risk of progression to the next stage. But a similar patient who has a GFR of 50 with A3 proteinuria will fall in the very high risk range for progression of the kidney disease. 
So our index patient, she had fell somewhere over here. So now coming to the etiology of chronic kidney disease, it can stem basically from anywhere in the kidney and urinary tract. Like most commonly we have the congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract which have abnormalities leading to the patient going into CKD or we, it can stem from the glomerular damage or tubular interstitial compartment damage or vascular injuries. So non-glomerular causes, they constitute the majority of the cases of CKD. Our index patient, she had no chronic symptoms. There was no history of any prevent significant illness. She never had hematuria or any episode of decreased urine output. There were no urinary complaints, no extraurinal abnormalities on the examination, and the ultrasound revealed no hydronephrosis. So a possibility of CACUT with hyper, most likely hypodysplasia was kept. So coming to the course, for chronic kidney disease, she was started on maintenance hemodialysis, initially by IJV line, then an AV fistula was made, and a palm cath was put. For hypertension, she was managed with amlodipine and labetalol, and while admitted, she had fever, which was attributed to catheter-related bloodstream infection. All the cultures were negative, and she received antibiotics for some time. She had pancytopenia at presentation, the workup for which revealed decreased C3 and uh, ANA, which was 2 plus speckled, with negative anti-DS DNA. The ferritin, vitamin B12, folate, and DCT were normal. And the bone marrow revealed hypocellular marrow with 50 to 60 percent cellularity with early paratrabecular fibrosis. So it was attributed to either CKD induced myelofibrosis versus SLE. Then for anemia, the patient received one unit PRVC transfusion. IV iron was given along with hemodialysis and she was started on erythropoietin. She had hypovitaminosis D and deficiency and uh, hyperparathyroidism. That was managed with vitamin D, calcium, and procalcitriol. Finally, she was discharged on maintenance hemodialysis with excess being a permacath. So a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease, stage 5, hemodialysis dependent, with etiology being CACUT was kept, with complications of growth failure, hypertension, anemia, mineral bone disease, and metabolic disorder. This so coming to the complications of CKD, they can be multiple, starting from growth retardation, hypertension, anemia, mineral bone disease, metabolic acidosis, and RRT-related complications. So we'll be discussing about anemia and mineral bone disease. The anemia in CKD for the patients that we see falls if the patient has a HP of less than 11 to 11.5. And the prevalence, it is highly prevalent with stage 3 patients, around 70% of the patients having anemia. And 87% of stage 4 patients and almost all the stage 5 patients will have anemia. Coming to the etiology, the etiology is multifactorial. Basically, CKD is a hyperinflammatory state. So there is decreased excretion of the inflammatory uh, cytokines and markers that are re released in the body. So this leads to a chronic inflammation and increased hepcidin level. There is also decreased production of erythropoietin as well as the resistance to the existing erythropoietin. The inflammation, it leads to poor appetite and poor nutrition of the child. With recurrent blood losses in the form of phlebotomy or dialysis related losses adding to it. And then this leads to increased demands with a decreased GI absorption due to increased hepcidin. And also due to the uremia and the other metabolites that are accumulated, the erythrocyte survival is decreased. So coming to the management, the management of anemia in CKD, we have to target a FHB of 11 with a closed follow-up with iron, ferritin, and transferrin saturation. So if the patient does not have anemia and falls in the CKD stage 3 to 5 range, we will start oral iron supplementation at a lower dose, 3 to 4 m mg per kg per day. But uh, if the patient has anemia, then he has to be worked out for all these and uh, Whenever we have a transferrin saturation of less than 20 or ferritin reflecting iron stores less than 100, we consider it as iron deficiency and we start the patient on iron supplementation. The iron supplementation is given orally for the patients who are on peritoneal dialysis or are pre-dialysis patients. But for patients who are on hemodialysis, they are given IV iron for the ease of convenience and to avoid the side effects. So at any time, if the patient has a transferrin saturation of more than 20% with ferritin greater than 100 and no other causes are there, then we label it as anemia of chronic disease and we have to start erythropoietin. Our patient, index patient, she was receiving regular IV iron with the hemodialysis 
and uh, erythropoietin at 300 international unit per kg per week. Now coming to CKD mineral and bone disorder. We label the patient as having CKD mineral and bone disorder whenever the patient has abnormalities of either calcium, phosphate, PTH, FGF23 or vitamin D. Or we can have problems with the bone turnover, mineralization, volume, strength or linear growth. Or there can be extra skeletal calcifications. So basically in CKD what happens is the excretion of the phosphorus is decreased leading to hyperphosphatemia which stimulates the production of fibroblast growth factor 23 in the bones which acts in the body to decrease the PTH production and to inhibit the action of vitamin D. So vitamin D is inhibited which leads to hypocalcemia and this hypocalcemia will again stimulate the PTH. So basically to understand it better, we have a fall in EGFR which leads to increase in serum phosphorus and subsequently decrease in serum calcium. To counteract this, the body produces more PTH and this more PTH again it achieves a plateau phase and then again whenever there is a fall in GFR which is occurring continuously in the patients, we will have a situation in where a new steady state is achieved every time to restore the serum phosphate to normal at the expense of sustained high PTH levels. So the management of mineral bone disease basically focuses on this hyperphosphatemia. We have to curtail the phosphate intake to less than 80%. We have to use phosphate binders if we have to. And most importantly, we have to look for the dialysis adequacy because phosphate is supposed to be removed in the dialysis. For calcium, we have to supplement, supplement calcium to keep it in the normal range. Vitamin D deficiency if we encounter in these patients is counteracted by treating with vitamin D for three months. And uh, a word about active vitamin D, rho calcitriol that we usually give. Uh, they are used if we have a persistently elevated PTH level. And the prerequisites are like we should have, the patient should have a vitamin D of more than 30 with a calcium phosphorus product of less than 55 to avoid extra, uh, extra skeletal calcifications. So index patient, she had hypocalcemia. She was given calcium supplementation. She had hyperparathyroidism. She received activity vitamin D for some time to suppress the PTH. And uh, she had hyperphosphatemia, which was taken care of by RRT. RRT like renal replacement therapy. A word about renal replacement therapy, this is the therapy that replaces or substitutes for the normal blood, blood fun filtering function of the kidney and provides electrolyte and fluid balance as well as the toxin removal functions of the kidney. Basically it takes over the functions of the kidney. So the ultimate renal replacement therapy that we aim for is transplant with bridging therapies with peritoneal or hemodialysis. The RRT basically initiated, it is initiated based on the level of GFR and individual factors. With the following estimated GFR, it is, exp uh, it is evident that the kidney function is declining. So whenever the EGFR is less than 30, we start educating the patient that uh, there is an impending need for hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis or transplant in this patient. And uh, below f level of 15, we need to consider that starting the RRT. And uh, below a level of 6 to 12, irrespective of everything, we have to start RRT. But there are certain situations in which the patient may be having an EGFR of way above 6 to 12 range, like maybe 30s, 40s range. But if they have a persistent uh, refractory hyperphosphatemia, acidosis, hyperkalemia, or they have uremic encephalopathy, hypertensive emergencies, or the patient is having poor growth despite controlling all the measures, then we need to start renal replacement therapy. And the choice of renal replacement therapy is basically patient-based, whether the patient needs a hemodialysis or a peritoneal dialysis, with some salient points with peritoneal dialysis being that it is more conducive for school and social activities. It is done at home. The our duration of the therapy can be controlled at home. The timing can be extended to adjust for the school and social activities. It is better for adequate nutrition because the small children, they will be having a liquid-based diet. So the therapy can be conveniently increased at home to improve the removal of the excess fluid that the patient is taking to maintain adequate nutrition. And it has somewhat better preservation of the residual renal function. The decline in renal function is seen to be decreased with use of this peritoneal dialysis. But there is a, some side effects like the patient has a, can have a membrane, peritoneal membrane failure with prolonged use, leading this method ineffective as a RRT. Other ways, the hemodialysis, it is used whenever the patient is anuric, oligoanuric. The patient is not producing enough urine and it is totally dependent on the RRT. So this is a 
better efficient method and uh, we go for hemodialysis in such patients. But here there is an issue of vascular access for hemodialysis. So the access for uh, hemodialysis basically it depends whether we are doing an acute hemodialysis or we are planning a chronic dialysis. For acute hemodialysis we usually use the HD catheter that we commonly see the percutaneous dual lumen catheter or we can use the catheter that is tunneled to decrease the risk of infection that is perm cath. And for chronic access we have arteriovenous fistula and arteriovenous crafts. The arteriovenous fistula is being the modality of choice for chronic hemodialysis. The index patient, she was initially started on a percutaneous dual lumen catheter because she landed in uh, emergency kind of a situation with, in an IJV catheter. Later a fistula was created and pending the maturation of the fistula which take around 4 to 5 weeks, she was uh, put a permacath or a tunneled cuffed catheter to undergo dialysis which we can use till 6 months. Now coming to the course, she had multiple admissions and in January 2020 she had her second admission. With the complaints of swelling of left arm for five days. She had no trauma or redness or swelling elsewhere. The examination revealed that there was no brui over the fistula and the left radial and ulnar pulses were not well palpable. So a diagnosis of AV fistula thrombosis was made and she underwent a thrombectomy. Then in August 2020, her third admission, she was admitted with complaints of fever, cough, breathing difficulty and headache for one day and the examination revealed tachypnea with normal SpO2 and uh, we did a COVID test and she was positive for COVID and she had COVID pneumonia as well as COVID pneumonia and while she was admitted she had a rash that was diffuse erythematous papular rash. It involved both palms and soles. The workup revealed decreased C3 and uh, ANA which was 3 plus homogeneous. A skin biopsy was also done which revealed epidermal thinning and uh, flattening and hyperkeratosis. There was focal basal cell degeneration and evidence of interface activity. The DAEF done was negative. So a possibility of DRESS versus SLE was considered and she was started on steroids. With this the complaints resolved. And then again in February 21 she was admitted with complaints of respiratory distress for 20 days. There was no fever, cough or any joint or rash pain, rash or joint pain this time. On examination her left upper arm veins were tortuous and dilated as we can see in this picture. The heart rate was 128, she had tachypnea, systolic murmur with hyperdynamic apex with the rest of the examination being within normal limits. So a diagnosis of high flow fistula and uh, she underwent reduction using distal inflow. Uh, for this I would like to invite Dr. Nathan. Good morning everybody. Uh, I am Dr. S. Vanjiradhan from uh, Department of Renal Transplant Surgery. I'll uh, talk about pediatric AV fistula and in specific to this case. So, arteriovenous fistula, as all you know, is a, a surgically tailored anastomosis between an artery and vein, uh, following which the vein matures and, for, and uh, which can be used for uh, hemodialysis. So, uh, in adults, as such, AV fistula is the preferred type of vascular access for hemodialysis, which the preference may vary in children. Uh, the reason being uh, the fistula has a longer patency and the rates of complications are lower when compared to other modalities of access. So the complications of uh, the AV fistula can include uh, aneurysm, uh, infection, including surgical site infection and the vascular infection, and uh, vascular infection leading to systemic infection also and distal ischemic steel syndrome when there is high flow in the fistula the distal blood flow reduces causing steel syndrome and uh, fistula thrombosis and for the sick consequence of which is a venous hypertension so in children uh, ultimately all the children who are undergoing dialysis may or may not be considered for uh, kidney transplantation uh, for the current scenario uh, the av fistulas in children have not been uh, widely accepted uh, most of the children uh, either have a capd or a tunnel catheter so the issues of uh, AV fistula are these. Uh, first of all, there are technical difficulties in forming AV fistulas. Uh, it needs expertise, surgical expertise. The artery and vein are uh, smaller in size, and it's uh, not everyone's uh, work to do, uh, do, do a pediatric AV fistula. And initiating a dialysis in such a fistula will need a dialysis expertise, which again uh, is not common. 
Uh, one more issue is uh, the patient concerns. Children do not usually tolerate pain, so uh, there is concerns regarding uh, puncture pain. Then, if at all the, any complication arises, maybe bleeding or uh, uh, thrombosis, or, or the fistula turns out to be a high flow fistula, uh, there is positive of experience which uh, any uh, which not it's, it's just not available everywhere. And uh, obviously, there is reluctance in considering the AV fistula for children with ESRD. But the advantages of AV fistula are a better quality dialysis. The infection rate in fistula is very less compared to a patient who has a catheter uh, for a dialysis. And uh, there is, if a fistula is successful, then there are uh, very less chances to change the axis. And the hospitalization rate is very less with a functioning AV fistula. So for this index case, uh, after the patient was uh, started on dialysis using a, a, a catheter, the patient came to us for uh, fistula creation. So after the initial assessment in March 2019, patient uh, underwent a ref to brachiocephalic fistula. Our plan was initially to, uh, whenever the patient comes to us, our plan is always to make a fistula as distally as possible. So the most distal option is a radiocephalic fistula. But in the uh, in the children, we always prefer a brachiocephalic fistula because the radial atrica size is very uh, less. And so the brachiocephalic fistula was made, it, uh, following which the fistula became functional. Uh, and it was working well for almost a year. Then the patient came to us in Jan 2020 with the uh, thrombosis of the left brachiocephalic fistula. Uh, so after assessment and planning, patient underwent a, a BCF thrombectomy. But uh, uh, following this thrombectomy, uh, the patient again developed a rethrombosis. And uh, due, but that thrombosis was not was not complete. It was a partial thrombosis. So, so in view of uh, partial thrombosis, the the venous collaterals in the upper limb opened up and the blood flow was uh, redirected in all the collaterals. So the patient's fistula was still patent irrespective of the thrombosis. So due to this uh, high flow fistula, the patient had uh, uh, again uh, features of overload and in March 2021, patients uh, under, again, again underwent a procedure which we call it as RUDI, revision using distal inflow. So the problem was with, with this patient in specific was when the BCF was made, it was a high flow fistula. When you have a high flow fistula, the shearing stress caused by the high blood flow, the turbulent blood flow, it causes endothelial injury. So following endothelial injury, there is venous intimal hyperplasia, uh, which caused a central venous stenosis in this patient. So following the central venous stenosis, it ultimately leads to thrombosis. And when the thrombosis is not complete, in this case, initially it was complete. Uh, after thrombectomy, it, a patient again uh, developed a recurrent uh, partial thrombosis. So due to this partial thrombosis, the part of the vein which was distal to the thrombosis was patent and the multiple collaterals arising from that vein uh, began to uh, take up the uh, blood flow. So there was extensive collateralization in this patient which maintained uh, the fistula patent. Uh, so post-procedure after the patient had a rethrombosis, we planned for a flow reduction. These are some of the uh, procedures uh, considered for flow reduction. Uh, one is banding, the another one is drill, uh, distal revascularization with interval ligation. Next is PAI, proximalization of the arterial inflow. And ultimately, which the patient underwent was a RUDI, revision using distal inflow. In this, we primarily ligate uh, the fistula which was initially made, the anastomosis which was initially made is ligated and uh, the distal, one of the distal arteries is used uh, for uh, arterial inflow. The goal is to reduce the blood inflow, arterial inflow into the fistula vein and thereby decreasing the uh, symptoms of high flow or some cases we do Rudy for uh, steel syndrome also in, for like uh, diabetic patients which have, we, who have a uh, 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 syndrome in the distal part of the hand. So after Rudy, they are expected to improve. So, yeah, uh, the current status of this patient, you can see the uh, the extreme left image shows the fistula with the uh, patent vein, and uh, the next picture shows there is extensive collateralization, and the uh, last third picture shows the patient has uh, uh, dilated veins. What you see. What you see here is uh, ulnar, ulnar, 
a basal equine, sorry. Uh, what you see here is basal equine. So ultimately, the blood flow from the cephalic equine is redirected into the uh, lateral uh, channels and which st goes till the wrist joint of the patient and the blood flow is again coming back through the basilic uh, system of the patient. So the access for the patient is taken, uh, the arterial access is taken near the fistula and the venous return is given via this uh, basilic system. So further plan of this patient would be uh, irrespective of, uh, in spite of the patient getting uh, fistula reduction surgery done, if she develops symptoms of cardiac overload, then we can plan, there are few options, one of which can be uh, ligation of uh, BCF brachiocephalic vein and we can uh, make a alnobasilic vein, but still it would be a risk for this patient because every time the all three procedures she, which she underwent, she underwent under general anesthesia. So taking up the child in GA under uh, every situation is not easy. One more option can be the patient has multiple collaterals, so we can choose one uh, proper collateral which is adequately uh, dilated and uh, used for dialysis and ligate all other collaterals so that patient can maintain a single uh, vein for cannulation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Banji. And now coming back to the disease course, uh, latest in July 22, the patient was admitted with us again, this time with the complaints of chest pain for 15 days and low-grade fever for 7 days. There was no history of cough, breathing difficulty or exertional dyspnea. The examination revealed tachypnea with pallor. The left arm veins were again tortuous and dilated. Uh, bilateral crepitations were there and the S1, S2 was loud when the patient had hepatomegaly. So a di diagnosis of pneumonia was made and she was started on antibiotics and uh, for fluid overload she was started on maintenance hemodialysis that she was already undergoing but had missed a session. So while admitted she had a uh, event of mucositis and uh, along with pancytopenia and there was also a rash, again a generalized maculopapular rash. The workup revealed decreased C3, C3 and uh, ANA which was this time 2 to 3 plus homogeneous and the anti-DSDNA done was positive. A skin biopsy was done which revealed hyperkeratosis and focal parakeratosis. There was edema in the upper dermis and minimal perivascular lymphocytic infiltrates. The immunofluorescence for the skin biopsy done at this time again was negative. So a uh, possibility of lupus was considered and the patient was started on steroids. So to tell about this, I would like to invite Dr. Anubha from the Department of Dermatology. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I would be just stressing on the cutaneous manifestations that were seen in this child when we first received the call. So uh, when we first got the call, the patient had three different distinct morphologies uh, in the mucocutaneous area. So the first was oral mucositis. So the child had this kind of a presentation. Uh, so there were diffuse erosions all over the oral mucosa, and that was covered with a whitish kind of a slough. And there was minimal involvement of the lips. There was no hemorrhagic crusting seen. Only mild colitis was present. So apart from that, the patient also had this kind of a, um, a hyperpigmented rash over the trunks. So patchy hyperpigmentation over the trunks and the proximal upper limbs as well. So me, we mostly, and on blanching the skin, there was still some amount of residual erythema that was seen. So we made this out to be a resolving kind of a maculopapular rash. And the patient also gave history of a rash in 2020 as well. But the rash was not that distinct at this point of time. It was mostly in the resolving phase. The third morphology that we saw in this patient was in the palms and soles. So we th saw the, it's not very clear in the picture, sorry. So we saw this kind of pinpoint petechial macules that were seen over the tips of the toes and other areas of the soles as well. And these lesions were also somewhat resolving with hyperpigmentation when we saw the patient. So we made this out to be vasculitic lesions. This pinpoint petechial macules is very characteristic of leukocytoclastic vasculitis that is seen in many of the connective tissue disorders. So, and apart from that, there was also reduced growth of hair and increased hair loss that was reported by the parents. So based on all these findings, I would just like to stress on the cutaneous manifestations of lupus erythematosus. So a good um, reference point is to refer to this Gilliam classification of cutaneous lupus that has acute lupus, subacute uh, cutaneous lupus, and chronic cutaneous lupus. So coming to the acute cutaneous lupus, this is the very characteristic lesion that we always see is the malar rash sparing the nasolabial folds. However, it was not seen in this index patient. 
and the patient probably had this macular papular rash. Now, in Indian skin, it is sometimes very difficult to appreciate macular papular rash because of the darker color of the skin. So, a good reference point would be to slightly blanch the skin using your fingers and then you will be able to appreciate the erythema when it comes back. So, that was positive in this index patient. Apart from this, a SGS 10-like manifestation can also be seen. And this is a very characteristic classical lesion of subacute cutaneous lupus where you see these annular uh, uh, scaly kind of plaques over the trunk. And this is a characteristic discoid lupus erythematosus lesion. They will be mostly isolated lesions with a central hypopigmentation and peripheral hypopigment hyperpigmentation along with scarring. And this is a disseminated discoid lupus erythematosus rash. So uh, uh, coming to this R index, this index patient, it was mostly fitting into acute rash of acute cutaneous lupus, which is the macular papillar rash kind. So lupus erythematosus can, uh, can present with both systemic and skin disease, and there can be various permutations and combinations and causes that can be possible. With the three different types of LE can occur along with SLE in various forms. Both systemic disease can be present standalone. It can be present with skin lesion, which can occur both in the initial course or later in the course of the disease. So uh, apart from the LE-specific lesions, we also have a lot of non-specific uh, uh, cutaneous lesions that can occur with LE. So in this patient, what was striking, this is not uh, pictures, this is just for reference, uh, these pinpoint particular lesions that are commonly seen in palms and soles, along with the palpable purpuric lesion in the lower limb also can often be very commonly seen in patients of LE. So uh, this is, I, I just put this picture for reference, this is a picture of lupus hair. It is very commonly seen in most of our pediatric patients also. So they'll have this short stubby kind of hair at the hairline, along with reduced growth and um, uh, easy breakability. So in 2020, also the patient gave history of some rash. Uh, we had, I, I'm not sure if we had seen the patient that time or not, and records were not available, but a biopsy was done from the rash, which showed epidermal thinning, flattening of the rated regions, along with occasional apoptotic keratinocytes. So there is some kind of an epidermal atrophy going on, along with some interface changes. There was focal uh, basal cell vacuolization as well, but there was no thickening of basement membrane. Now, thickening of basement membrane is seen more in the chronic cutaneous LE and subacute cutaneous LE spectrum, less commonly seen in the acute spectrum. And there was some uh, perivascular periadnic cell um, infiltrate in the dermis, which was nonspecific. However, the past stain and the alcyon blue stain highlighted mild increase in dermal mucin. Now, this is very specific finding for connective tissue disorders, both lupus and dermatomyositis. So, in this case, it fits more with lupus. So this is a very good differentiate, uh, differentiating point from macular papillar rash related to CTDs and uh, dress or other drug rashes. So in, again, uh, when we saw the patient now in August also, uh, we uh, again performed a skin biopsy from the lesions over the toes. However, this only showed hyperkeratosis, focal parakeratosis, mild edema in the upper dermis, along with minimal perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate. And no interface changes were seen, and even DIF was negative. So this, the reason we did not get much yield out of this biopsy was probably because of the timing of the biopsy. It was performed late in the course of the disease when the rash was already resolving. So just one point about lupus band test. So it is basically the deposition of immunoglobulins and complement in the skin at the basement membrane zone. And when three or more immunoreactants are present in the non-lesional photoprotected skin in patients of LE, the diagnostic specificity and sensitivity for LE is very high. So, however, DIF was negative in this index uh, patient, uh, probably, I, as I already mentioned, because of the timing of the biopsy. So, another possibility is candidiasis. Now, oral candidiasis uh, is the stop picture on the right basically presents with these curdy white or milk, uh, creamy uh, patches that are stuck onto the wall of the oral mucosa. And when you wipe it off with the gauze, it can easily be wiped off. However, ulcers of LE will be mostly present as erythematous, shallow erosions, and sometimes it will be covered with the white slough. Now, they can be localized also, and they can be uh, generalized covering the entire mucosal surface, as was seen in our patient. And this is this picture uh, is a picture of a DLE oral uh, lesion, which has the central scarring and peripheral radiating st uh, whitish striae. So how do we differentiate um, macular papular rash of lupus from drug rash and dress? So there, there can be no history of photosensitivity present in patients of drug rash. Facial involvement is seen in dress as well, but more in form of facial edema rather than a rash. And purpuric lesions and palmoplantar vasculitic lesions are relatively absent in patients of drug rash or dress. Leukocytoclastic vasculitis can be seen in dress as well, but it is extremely rare. 
and in histopathology interface changes also can be seen in drug rash but no mucin will be seen no epidermal atrophy will be seen and eosinophils is again a clinching point for diagnosis because the it will be a predominantly eosinophilic infiltrate in the dermis Again, lupus band test will be negative, and systemic involvement will occur much later after the onset of rash, like nephritis, hepatitis, uh, encephalitis. All this can also occur in dress, myocarditis, but they will occur after the rash is presented, and not unlike in this patient where patient already has systemic involvement and then presented with rash later on. So uh, this trial combination of mucositis, maculopapular rash, and uh, probably leukocytoplastic vasculitis, which we did not get on biopsy, we can find uh, uh, point towards three things: either a viral exanthem. Or a drug rash, or dress, or acute cutaneous LE. So, considering the other uh, systemic other features which were present, like diffuse hair fall, along with ANA positivity, along with systemic manifestations, both in the past as well as concurrently, uh, it fits better with acute cutaneous LE. And it is uh, mucositis also raises the possibility of oral candidiasis. However, uh, KOH was done in this patient, and it was found to be negative. So, there was no secondary infection with oral candidiasis as well. It was just plain mucositis of acute LE. Now I would like to invite Dr. Sanjeev. Uh, good morning, all. So I would like to start from the beginning. So we had a nine-year-old girl child who presented with fever, vomiting, breathing difficulty, reduced urine output for seven days in 2019. At presentation, she had pancytopenia, uremia, bilateral small shrunken kidney, cirrhosis, ANA two plus pickle pattern, low C3 with normal C4, and bone marrow myelofibrosis. Now the question is that at that time the child has lupus or not. So at that time several points was in favor of lupus such as girl child of nine years, fever, pancytopenia, positive ANA, and low C3. However, there are multiple points against the diagnosis of lupus at that point. No constitutional symptoms, short duration of presentation, no classical uh, cutaneous features, alopecia, oral ulcer, myelofibrosis in the index child, small shrunken kidney, and ANA two plus pickled pattern that is also found in the 5% normal population. So what happened in between 2019 and 2022 in follow-up? Child had several episodes of intermittent fever that was treated with antimicrobials. However, she didn't have any mucocutaneous and musculoskeletal features. She required multiple PRBC transfusion for severe anemia that was attributed to CKD, but we are not sure whether it was due to autoimmune hemolytic anemia or not. She had persistent thrombocytopenia in follow-up that was attributed to heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, maybe due to lupus also. And in the meantime, her ANA turned out to be homogeneous pattern from speckle pattern. She had raised anti-DSDNA titer, low C3 level. And in 2021, she had one episode of fever with skin rash. In presence of lymphopenia and thrombocytopenia, the child was diagnosed to have multisystemic inflammatory syndrome and treated with IVIG and steroid. So we are not sure whether at that time the di diagnosis of lupus was there or not, but one thing is against lupus that most of the oxygen child responded without steroid. That is against the diagnosis of lupus at that time. Presently in 2022, the call given for persistent fever for 18 days, blackish maculopapular rash over trunk, face, and ear lobule, oral thrust, and pancytopenia in the index child. On examination, she was found to have stunted and wasted. Her BP was controlled on multiple antihypertensive. She had severe pallor. She had blackish macular rash over abdomen, chest, back, face, and ear lobules. She had also features of pneumonia in the form of uh, bilateral capitation and tachypnea, and also she had hepatosplenomegaly. Initial investigation revealed pancytopenia, raised CRP with procalcitonin. On peripheral blood smears, she had macrocytes and cystocytes. She had hyperferritinemia that was attributed to CKD, and mild transaminitis and positive homogeneous ANA. So initial consideration was, is it flare of SLE, or the child is having autoimmune hemolytic anemia in the background of SLE? And also the child is having macrobiactation syndrome or not. So battery of investigation was advised to confirm the diagnosis of lupus, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, as well as macrobiactation syndrome in the index child. And the child was prescribed to continue antibiotics and hemodialysis. And she was initiated on oral prednisolone and sunscreen. Further on, an investigation uh, revealed severe anemia with thrombocytopenia, lymphopenia, increased CRP and calcitonin, uh, procalcitonin. DCT was positive, peripheral blood smear showed tear drop cells with macrocytes, LDH was high, serum ferritin was sky high in the tune of 16,000, anti-DSDNA titer was positive, C3 was low, however C4 was normal, 
Uh, skin biopsy in this admission showed epidermal keratosis with focal paracatosis. However, DIF was negative. So our diagnosis was systemic lupus uh, in the index style with minor organ involvement, cutaneous and hematological, in the form of thrombocytopenia and autoimmune hemolytic anemia. However, it is not sure whether it is drug-induced lupus or not. And also the child had myelofibrosis that may be related to lupus or also CKD and macrophage activation syndrome. It may be either infection triggered or related to lupus. So after seven days of starting immunosuppression, the child became afebrile, skin color changed, the oral mucositis disappeared, hepatosplenum gland reduced, cytopenia improved, and ferritis dropped down from 16,000 to 2,000. So point for discussion from pediatric rheumatology perspective is, uh, was the child had lupus at beginning, or the lupus evolved over the time in the index child? Second thing is the macrophage activation syndrome in lupus. And could it be the drug-induced lupus in the index child? And finally, the management of lupus in the index child. So if we, uh, the initially we have a diagnostic dilemma regarding the lupus, whether the child had lupus in 2019. So if we go through the different classification criteria, we can see uh, according to SLEEK 2012 criteria, at least four criteria should be positive out of the 17, at least one each from group. So index child had six point positive, so most likely as lupus. Again, if we go through 2019 ACR regular criteria, child met the MAST criteria, entry criteria, ANA was positive. And also she was scored to have 15, that is more than 10, and that is suggestive of lupus. But now the question is, at the presentation, the CKD was related to lupus or not? So if we go through the literature on renal manifestations of lupus, we can see that renal manifestations are more common in children in comparison to the adults. And around 70% children present with renal involvement within the first year of diagnosis. And usually we note the urinary sediments, cast, hematuria, and proteinuria during active proliferative glomerular nephritis. And one child with lupus presenting a CKD is very unusual. Uh, around 10 to 20% patient develop end-stage renal disease or CKD after mean duration of five to seven years. However, in the index child, the child had acute presentation, no phenotypic features and constitutional symptoms for lupus. She had no cast sediments and hematuria on previous urine reports. So the CKD in the initial presentation in the index child unlikely to be due to lupus. However, ANA immunoblot or renal biopsy at the time of presentation can confirm or exclude the possibility of lupus. So on regarding the hematological manifestation, anemia, thrombocytopenia, and leukopenia is the most common. In addition, thrombosis may be present in aplopositive patient. The index child has anemia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia in most of the time throughout the last three years. In addition, she required multiple blood transfusion in last three years. It may be due to related to autoimmune hemolytic anemia. We are not sure. However, the ANA immunoblot, reticulocyte count, and LDH in the previous admission could confirm or exclude the diagnosis of lupus in the index cell. Now coming to the macrophage activation syndrome in childhood lupus. Macrophage activation syndrome is seen in 9% patient of the childhood lupus patient, and it is mostly under-recognized, and it is with high mortality rate of 13%. The index child has organomegaly. Uh, she had hyperferritinemia, rising trend of ferritin from 2000 to 16,000. She had raised triglyceride, mild transaminitis, and also the ferritin dropped with steroid. So the child had macrophage activation syndrome, no doubt. However, it was related to infection triggered or it was related to lupus. We are not sure. So when we, ext uh, so when we uh, extrapolated our data from our unit, uh, around 2% children of lupus had macrophage activation syndrome. And most of the children treated with high dose of steroid even after they died. But in the index child, the child was treated with low dose of steroid and she responded. So most likely the index child has infection triggered macrophage activation syndrome. So initially the child had speckle pattern of uh, ANA2 plus that we found in the uh, normal population also. The characteristic feature is in lupus is homogeneous pattern. So over the time the ANA turned out homogeneous from speckle pattern. So the question is that the, is the child has developed drug-induced lupus or has the classical lupus from the initial part? So drug-induced lupus is a lupus-like syndrome temporarily related to continuous drug exposure, and it resolves after discontinuation of the drug. There are currently no standard diagnostic criteria for uh, drug-induced lupus. There is a long list of uh, drugs that causing dr lupus, out of which the index child was exposed to many drugs like clonidine, labetalol, and minoxidil, and prazosin for reasonable time period. There is a certain difference between the classical lupus and drug-induced lupus, mostly in the disease severity, the antibody profile, and treatment response. In drug-induced lupus, the disease severity is less in comparison to the classical lupus. 
and mostly patients are associated with antihistone antibody, and they respond nicely with the omission of the offending drug. So in the index child, uh, she had drug exposure for reasonable time duration with multiple drugs. She presently has a confirmed case of lupus based on the serology and clinical phenotype. However, in drug and risk lupus, usually they have hepatitis, and the skin lesion are like uh, uh, subacute cutaneous lupus. So the ANA immunoblast can confirm our diagnosis of drug and risk lupus. Regarding the management, the child with lupus uh, requires immunosuppression. The dose de depends on the major organ or minor organ involvement. In cases of minor organ involvement, the uh, dose of steroid are low. So index style child was started on oral prednisolone. And sun protective measures are also very important for the management as well as for to prevent the flare of the disease. So the child was started on sunscreen and as well as hydroxychloroquine. And our plan was to start immunomodulator like azathioprine instead of uh, steroid in follow-up. And also in follow-up, if the child turns out to be antihistone antibody positive, we will try to stop the offending drug and see the response. And also child was recommended to continue the hemodialysis and supportive measure. And also importantly, that this child required a renal transplant in future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjeev and Dr. Anuba. Now, uh, after all that, we had a cl now clinical diagnosis and a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease stage 5 hemodialysis dependent with etiology most likely being cacut and the patient having drug-induced lupus with complications of growth failure, hypertension, anemia, mineral bone disorder, and metabolic acidosis. So just a word about CKD progression. The whatever damage to the kidney has been done, but we have to salvage whatever the kidney function is left. And to do that, we have to look at the progression of CKD. And there are multiple factors that are implicated in the progression, like uh, elevated BP, high level of proteinuria, hypoalbuminemia, metabolic acidosis, dyslipidemia, hyperphosphatemia, and persistent anemia. Of these, the elevated blood pressure and the high level of proteinuria, they have shown to have an impact on the progression of CKD in children. So at every visit, we have to make sure that the patient has a BP around 50th centile, and uh, we have to reduce the level of proteinuria to as low as possible. And uh, about the immunizations, the immunization of the child should be updated as early as possible with all the vaccines that are available as per the schedule. Uh, and additional vaccines, the patient needs to get varicella vaccination, annual influenza vaccination, and pneumococcal vaccination every five years. And the dietary modifications are very important because uh, this is, a, as I already discussed, that the patient is having poor uh, nutrition and poor appetite. So we have to make sure that the energy that the patient is taking the calories is towards the higher end of the suggestory dietary, in dietary intake. And the target protein intake, it should be also at the upper end of the SDI, uh, suggested dietary intake. And with the, a patient who is undergoing peritoneal dialysis needs extra 0.1 to 0.3 gram per kg per day of uh, proteins. And the HD dependent patient need around 0.1 gram per kg per day extra. Uh, if we think that the patient, if we see that the patient is having high urea despite uh, everything, then we have to optimize the RRT. And post that, we can think of decreasing the intake. And uh, for the infants, breastfeeding is the preferred method. And uh, if needed, we can fortify the breast milk or infant formula, whatever the child is taking. And if the oral acceptance is not adequate, then we may need to give enteral tube feeding either supplementary or exclusively to the child because nutrition in CKD is very important. So the plan in index child is optimal medical management, which she is getting. Maintenance hemodialysis around three times a week, four hour session. And uh, we have to optimize the access for HD as uh, already discussed by Dr. Vanji and to watch for disease activity. And uh, finally, a transplant. The child is currently registered in the transplant registry for cadaveric kidney transplant. You can... In the meanwhile, a junior resident, please, uh, I think you should be having a lot of queries in this case. Ma'am, initially the child had ANM uh, 2 plus pickle pattern. Uh, in the, normally, the 